A very warm welcome to Bhutan This Week, our weekly news magazine program. I'm Pukkan. Our top stories this week. His Majesty the King receives UNDP Special Recognition Award for Outstanding Contribution to Human Development. Bhutan's growing democracy has helped advance development in the country. And the government expecting to receive draft report from the Fourth Pay Commission by the end of this month. The United Nations Development Program presented a special award of recognition to His Majesty the King to honor His Majesty's leadership in advancing human development and the well-being and happiness of the people of Bhutan. Akim Steiner, the administrator of UNDP and United Nations Under Secretary General, presented the award to His Majesty the King. The UNDP announced that the award takes into account three major human development achievements. His Majesty's championing of the holistic development paradigm of gross national happiness, His Majesty's leadership in environment conservation and climate action, which has resulted in Bhutan being the only carbon negative country in the world, and His Majesty's guidance, which ensured a smooth transition of the system of governance and strong democratic foundations to be established in Bhutan. According to a press release from the Foreign Ministry, this has been evident from the significant and tangible development results reflected in the National Human Development Report of 10 Years of Democracy. In a statement, Steiner said, Bhutan's progress and stability are a testament to the vision and guidance of His Majesty the King and the Royal Government. The country's success illustrates that ambitious, sustainable development policies coupled with commitment and enlightened leadership, can transform the lives of the people. The Nenfenso for BBS News. Bhutan's growing democracy over the last 10 years has helped advance development in the country. This is as per the National Human Development Report 2018, launched recently. The National Human Development Report attempts to show a decade of efforts to cement democratic governance in Bhutan, through the concept of gross national happiness. The report will serve as an advocacy tool to influence national policies and programs in order to promote human development in the country. The National Human Development Report is not meant to be simply a celebration of this. It's not to speak nice words to power but rather to provide a tool for our nation to reflect on its development, for the world to be able to reflect on progress and development. According to the report, from the advent of democracy till now, health, education, infrastructures and other core development indicators clearly show that democratically elected governments have made significant efforts to enhance human development. Bhutan's Human Development Index value has seen a rise of over 20% since 2005. The report also presents data from a perspective survey on a decade of parliamentary democracy. As per the survey, Bhutanese today are happy with the state of their democracy. It also revealed that Bhutanese perceive that they are more engaged than before in national decision-making processes. However, a substantial 36% of respondents to the survey perceived that democracy so far has not been able to reduce the gap between rich and poor. Other recent surveys have also shown that while measures of cross-national happiness have improved overall at the national level, urban Bhutanese tend to be happier than rural residents and men more than women. The National Human Development Report is the first of its kind initiated by UNDP Bhutan and the Parliament of Bhutan. This is Pasang Doji for BBS News. A draft report from the Fourth Pay Commission is expected to be submitted towards the end of this month. Prime Minister Dr. Lotus Ring revealed this during the Meet the Press session. With the motive to update people on the institution of the 4th Pay Commission, Lynch and Dr. Loti Tsring affirmed that the expert teams are currently working on completing the draft, which will be ready in a few weeks. The Institute Pay Commission is 
it's already there and then by the end of this month to maybe uh, beginning half of the next month uh, I'm expecting the draft to be uh, ready for discussion session today. So the expert team is working and you all know that uh, RMA Governor Tashpenjo is chairing the commission. In addition to it, the Prime Minister claimed that he was misquoted on the performance-based incentives by the media. No flat pay raise for civil servants at Hinsibala. They were men lang agidi. Ngagi tise pa shugadi. A flat raise doesn't cause any excitement. Sela la bila. Ani bini digi ngachigi ya ngu poljin sundu shudalu. Ta tinda lu ngachigi la lejimbe be miloye tip top chi gobe ese. La mado rigzel mado yu miloye te mangul tip top chi gobe ese. Ani be shushui se u mato chip kaar lu ngu po yasin mi top. Considering the miscommunication between the public and the government, Prime Minister gave assurances all civil servants will get their share of salary raise. Pay raise is coming. Everyone will get raise salary. No doubt about that. Percentage, flat amount, lump sum, I don't know. We will wait for their recommendation. My only request to pay commission was to give me that wow factor. That wow factor is value, uh, pay for the value of work. The Food Pay Commission was instituted on 10th January this year to examine and recommend the government on salary, allowances, benefits and other emoluments for civil servants and other relevant public servants. This is Pasang Doji for BBS News. It has been found that at least two in every five women in the country experience some form of violence from their partners. This is according to the National Survey Report on Prevalence of Violence Against Women and Girls in the Country. The report was launched at the National Textile Festival in Thimpu, coinciding with International Women's Day. Her Royal Highness Princess Chimi Yang graced the opening of the festival. The report reflects that more than two in every five women experience one or more forms of violence from their partners in their lifetime. The form of violence includes physical, sexual, psychological and economical violence. And almost one in three women experienced at least one of these violence in the last 12 months. By age group, the lifetime prevalence of physical violence by husbands or partners was highest among women of 30 to 34 years old. This is followed closely by women aged 50 to 60 years. The lowest was among women aged 15 to 19 years. The report states that the frequency of abuse increased if the trigger was alcohol. It also reflects that women suffering from miscarriages, mental distress and their children's well-being getting affected are some of the impacts of such violence. Two in every five women experiencing violence also do not confide or share their problems with others. More than 2,200 women and girls were surveyed for the report. According to a UNDP press release, these study findings will serve as foundation for understanding and integrating sensitivity and responsive interventions. This will enhance protection and promotion of the rights of women and girls in the country. The National Textile Festival is aimed at celebrating skills of women artisans of the country. <laughs> It was a norm before for a woman to stay back home and look after kids, and a husband will go out to earn. Nowadays, women are talented. We can equally do things like them. For me, out of interest, I go out with my husband and take some pictures. A woman shouldn't depend on her husband. We should be independent. We should do things for ourselves. For me, I am an artist and a painter. I saw and make things. Today, I have a handicraft. The festival will be open for the next three days. Something Dolker, BBS News. Despite many Bhutanese women taking up careers as entrepreneurs, it has been found women are still not as successful as men. As per a study conducted on growth of women in micro and small enterprises, 
The growth is largely in numbers but not in terms of business innovation and progression. Obstacles such as poor access to finance and inadequate business skills continue to impede the growth and innovation of women in micro and small enterprises. The study conducted last year mentions that women owned and managed only around 35% of registered micro, small and medium enterprises as per the 2016 Department of Cottage and Small Industries report. While the number is a considerable accomplishment, a huge number of women still operate their enterprises informally and at a micro level. And this remains a major concern as per the study. The majority of people engaged in entrepreneurship are in the unorganized sector, which are often referred to as the informal sector. So when you're talking about the informal sector, there's no documented data. So we really don't know. Nobody knows how many entrepreneurs are really there because there's no, there's no data. If you, look at the, you know, if you look at the engagement of women, mostly women, you'll see that they're entrepreneurs. They are entrepreneurs, but what are they doing? Have they succeeded? There's no data. The study has found that the main motivations for women participating in economic activities are not only to earn a livelihood, but also to enhance their social and economic status. The study concluded that obstacles needing immediate attention are poor access to finance, labor shortage, inadequate business skills, competition among similar enterprises, lack of proper business premises, formal education and training opportunities. We need to create a formal platform. We need to create a place where women can come, can drop in with their queries, with their questions, where they can sit in the comfort of a friendly environment and talk about women things. So I think if the government, you know, uh, does treat this uh, appeal, gives this appeal, uh, you know, from, it is not only from me, it is from women in Ngachi, Duvige Amsusu, that uh, opportunity to have a platform where we can, you know, sort of discuss our issues discuss our problems, uh, I think it will go a long way in solving problems because in that there will be networking. The study suggests that there is a lot to do to close the gap in terms of economic participation and achievement between men and women. Efforts also need to be taken to promote formal economic entrepreneurship among women and facilitate their advancement from micro enterprises to small and then towards medium and large enterprises. The 2018 Global Gender Gap Report has ranked Bhutan 122nd out of 149 countries at a global index. And in terms of economic participation and opportunity and political empowerment, Bhutan ranks 104th and 138th respectively. This means there is gender disparity in terms of women opportunities and participation in economic activities and in political empowerment. Calling to accelerate a gender-balanced world, this year's International Women's Day encourages balance between men and women in all aspects. And in Bhutan, it is economic participation and opportunity that calls for a balance. This is because women's economic participation holds a huge potential to address a host of national development issues such as poverty, unemployment, inequitable distribution of wealth and imbalanced regional development. Sunampem for BBS News. From being widowed to collecting waste and being discriminated for it, and then to recently winning an international award, 42-year-old Chogil Hamu, owner of Green Bhutan Waste Management in Pumta, has experienced it all. Her story of an unglamorous waste management startup, which is slowly getting recognized at home and abroad, is an inspiration on its own. Here is the winner of the 2018 SAC Woman Entrepreneur of the Year. My name is Shogilamo and I'm from Tongsa and my workplace is in Bumtang Garbang and my firm name is Green Bhutan West Management. Uh, I started in the year of 2007 and that, uh, that my first husband he got expired and my two sisters, my two elder sisters they told me if I keep on working in government service I can't survive 
and I can't feed my two kids and they brought me to my hometown and they they put me a shop so well setting up a shop I, I need a lot of money then I didn't have that much money so I started my uh, scrap work from that in the year of 2014 London Foundation gave me a loan and uh, for an uh, uh, interest free so I thought of starting in Tongsa, but the fees was not stable and it's mercy, so I couldn't start there. Moreover, the west is less there, so I, shif I shifted my firm in Bumtang. I started here from uh, 2017. We collect all kind of west tin cans. We compressed bad bottles. We compressed. We sent it to India for sale, and. Uh, from e-west, we, uh, we take out copper, aluminium, we make, we give it to local blacksmith, we make pots, pan, and we find market to sell it, but till now we haven't, we are still collecting more to sell. And plastic, we make baskets, and we are selling it. Lack of staff, if you get uh, staff also, people discriminate them. They say like doing waste job, it's not good for their family, the people. If they work there, they, they never say, don't let your children work there. It's not good for them. Only the low people, low caste people will work there. They say like that and I don't have driver. I have to go myself, drive myself, load myself. And I can't give time for my family. I have to get up early in the morning, six o'clock. I have to cook, my, cook for my children after that. I by 8:30 I go to work. Then when I when I come back from work, it's get around 6, 7:30. I can't give my full time for my kids, my husband. These are the some of the challenges that I'm facing. Some people when we go to their place, we for collection. Some people they they really discriminate us. Some people when we pile up the west, they kick our thing. West with time passing by, and people they come to know about west. And me and my staff we collect from door to door. Like our collection itself makes uh, their surrounding clean. And they don't have to go to dump to landfill. We give service, and from that, there's some people they respect us, and and the most of people they know the value of West. I was not uh, informed that I was winner. And, um, Bawi, they called me up. And they said uh, my name was nominated for the uh, uh, award. So, I didn't, uh, so when I went down there in Sri Lanka, when they announced my name, I was really happy. I had a long journey. It's been about uh, 10 years. I've been working on West, so I get uh, discriminated from people. They don't like me working in this. After getting this award, I felt that I was not wrong. Uh, whatever I did, I did it for good. And I felt like the job I'm doing has really made me happy and awarded me with this. Come up with different ideas. Don't feel that you can't do. Don't look for good white collar job. Uh, you can st always uh, start from small thing and you'll never know when it go goes big. More than 100 years after the world received its first licensed female pilot, Drukia made its own history. Celebrating the International Women's Day, the Royal Bhutan Airlines operated its first ever all-female crew flight. KB-130, powered to Bangkok flight, operated under the command of Captain Ugin Dema, Bhutan's first female pilot and captain. Inside the cockpit were two other female crew assisting Captain Ugin. The cabin crew as well were all female. Outside, from the check-in to ground staff to push back team, female staff handled it all for the Bangkok-bound Airbus 319. We now presently have our first licensed fl uh, female flight engineer, uh, Sonam Deki. So she'll be joining us today. And very soon, we will ha we'll be having our uh, senior first officer, Sonam Lamo. She'll be starting her command training as well. So I think nothing speaks progress more than exemplifying it. And this flight today exemplifies the theme of uh, this year, Balance for Better. Starting from our security staff, to our, hand, uh, to our checking crew, to 
to our cabin crew, to our loading crew, to our catering crew, and to our flying crew are all handled by women. So we belong everywhere. We are part of the change and we are part of the innovation. Globally, the renowned airlines, they are doing it recently now. So for a company like Trick Air, and we are able to produce a whole female set crew. So that's a great honor to be a part of the, that team. As a female in the aviation industry, um, I have neither received any special treatment nor have there been any discrimination. So uh, we are recognized for our hard work, for our input and for our dedicated service. But people do appreciate as a female working in the male-dominated industry. So it's a good feeling. Reflecting on the progress made within the last 37 years, today Druguer celebrates the presence of women in every aspect of the aviation field. Currently, it has 168 women employees, which translates to 35% of its workforce. Flying and aviation is seen as a very high level of expertise, you know. So when women can match up to men and flying in a place like Paro, which is um, the most difficult and demanding airport in the world, you know, even very experienced captains, when they fly into Bhutan, they, they can't even try, begin to think about landing without practice. When somebody like Ugin Dema can come up and do it, be competent, and when women can handle a flight in Paro, we can, all we can be is very proud of them. As the first all-female crew flight took off, it had on board the airline company's hopes to inspire more women to get into the aviation industry. For Sangeet Chazum in Paro, Sonomongdi, PBS News. Unlike in the past, veterinarians in the country will now be able to provide better diagnostic services to animals. Nearly 30 animal doctors were trained on ultrasonography and radiology. Sik Chocham is at the National Veterinary Hospital. For the last two weeks, she has not been eating and has breathing problem. And today she is lucky. Radio imaging expert Dr. Nicolette is here training the animal doctors. Ultrasound scan reveals that Chocham has fluids in her chest that is causing breathing problem and gets treated. Uh, if she's struggling to breathe this much, this is where we stop, alright? Chocham is the first animal in Bhutan to receive an ultrasound scan. This would not have been possible a few days ago. As a field practitioner, I was really handicapped without having diagnostic equipment, ultrasound and x-ray machine. So, we have been doing, till now we have been doing empirical treatment and symptomatic treatment. So this will ultimately work towards the animal welfare and uh, the end is we are going to provide the services that is professional as well as that is helpful for the animals. There are five ultrasound and two x-ray machines which were unused till now. Lack of adequate knowledge on use of this equipment hampered early diagnostic and providing timely treatment. Sometimes diagnosis without the help of ultrasound or x-ray, we, we won't be able to diagnose. For example, only the things which we could see visually with our own naked eyes, those things only we can be, it can be diagnosed. But with ultrasound, we can go into deeper uh, inner organs and see the condition and we can come to a conclusion. The specialized training is expected to enhance diagnostic capacity of the animal doctors and meet service demand, particularly of the pet lovers. This is Sonam Chodan for PBS News. One of the best ways to control plastic pollution is to reuse plastic waste. In Mongar, a farmer from Fozrung village has been doing just that by practicing plastic mulching. Plastic mulching involves covering thin plastic layers on top of soil to control growth of weeds. 26-year-old Kezan Singe from Fosurung is the first person in his village to use plastic mulches to control weeds along electric fences in his fields. He collects plastic waste and reuses them as plastic mulches. It was a few months ago that Kazang put this idea into action, around the same time when the news to reimpose use and sale of plastic bags came out. 
These days, everyone considers plastic bags as wastes everywhere, and government is soon going to reimpose the ban on using plastic bags. But if we can manage its use, I feel plastics have a lot of benefits. This year, I got this new idea to use plastics to control growth of weeds around the electric fences. Usually, we would have to carry out weeding along the fences every week basis, but I don't have to do this anymore. And it was from his father, Wonshu, that Kezong got this innovative idea. I got the idea of plastic mulching through one of my own experiences. One time, I forgot to collect a tent sheet lying outside and it was kept on the ground for almost a month. When I went to collect it, I saw all the grasses covered by the tent had dried up and died. So I thought this technique, which is called plastic mulching, could be used to control wheat that grow along the electric fences. Although this technique is useful in easing labor shortage and controlling wheat growth, agricultural officials say they don't encourage it since it is not environmental friendly. Some farmers in Mungar also use plastic mulching in vegetable gardens and orchards to speed up crop growth. For Sunam Sering in Mongar, Sunam Pem for BBS News. That's all we have for you this week. Thank you very much for watching.